Welcome to Ensuring Quality in Your Online Course. Uh, this workshop is actually um, an introduction to Quality Matters. So I thought we could just go ahead today um, and get started with some introductions. I'd like to know just a little bit about you um, and then we can look at what's on the agenda. But um, if you could tell me even in the text chat, um, what do you teach and maybe what you hope to get out of this workshop. So I'll let you type for a minute. Great, I see some answers sort of filtering in here. So we have Elise from nursing. Ellen teaches courses in medical laboratory sciences program. And Ellen has been a part of QM workshops in the past, but is looking for a review. Excellent, I have some updates on QM. So a few things are changing. So um, maybe I'll have some exciting new news for you. And Anne teaches in history and Latin American studies. Very impressive. So Anne or Elise, have you ever um, worked with QM or heard of it or any experience with that? Um, I haven't. Um, I just uh, I graduated last uh, May with my doctoral degree, so I've been teaching in the um, doctoral program or the master's program and doctoral program in the nursing building. So just hoping to get a little bit um, more information, better teaching strategies, and such. Excellent. Okay. So um, part of what we're going to do today is we're going to check out what is QM. Um, they have a specific rubric of standards that they. Uh, encourage for all online courses. And so we're actually going to take a look at that. And um, I'm going to give you a couple of activities where you can kind of provide some of your own input. Wonderful. All right. So um, just so you know what's on the agenda, um, hopefully by the end of today's workshop, you'll be able to define um, what it means for online course quality, what it means to measure that quality, and how to evaluate the quality. Also, we're going to take a look at specifically what is Quality Matters versus what is it not. Um, and then we're going to detail in a little bit. They've got kind of what I call eight um, categories or subsections. Um, and then they have 42 specific um, standards on the rubric. So we're going to get to take a, a look at at least some of those today. Um, and like I said, I, I hate boring workshops. So um, part of the activity is for you to see if you can identify some of these elements um, maybe in your own course. And then one of the other things that we'll take a look at is we've developed um, our own internal course review uh, system at NIU called Quality Essentials. Um, and so we've got that as well as other workshops that can help you with um, all of these different strategies today. All right. So out of curiosity, and I, I always like to throw this question um, at people first, is who do you think are the primary stakeholders when we talk about online course quality? Who's really invested in this? And I love my little brainstorm icon. It's just so silly. But if you can go ahead and type this in the chat, let me know. Um, who do you think is really invested in this? yes to all of these answers. I see students, the instructor and the students, uh, the institution and the departments, absolutely. So you hit on a lot of these uh, 
main people who are invested in course quality, but just to throw out a couple of other ones in there. Um, certainly we have the administrators. So this could be your dean, your department chair. They want to make sure that the success of their program is, is taking off. Um, we're also looking at accrediting agencies. So as online education has really peaked, um, as my colleague likes to say, there are some bad actors out there. There are kind of some um, faux or pretend agencies um, who aren't really assessing the course quality. So uh, we do really want to look at some of these nonprofit accrediting agencies um, that are really invested in ensuring that the online course quality is there. Certainly your university or your institution. And in our case, because NIU is a state university, we we also want to take a look at the taxpayers and uh, make sure that the quality of education that we're providing in an online format um, meets or exceeds their expectations. So now let's actually talk about QM. Who, who is this mystery QM? Uh, they are Quality Matters. We often refer to them as QM. But Quality Matters is a group that is nationally recognized. Uh, they are something of the gold standard out there. Uh, they are a faculty-driven peer review process. So again, it's the same people who teach online who are reviewing online courses. Um, and this is used to ensure that the quality of courses is out there for both um, online courses or blended courses. So any type of course that has um, a high online presence. And the way that they go about providing these standards for online course quality is they come up with rubrics um, and a set of tools and standards for designing and reviewing courses. So Quality Matters kind of operates on what I call the four C's. And these underlying principles um, start with being continuous. So one of the, the big things about Quality Matters is this idea that your course is, is always going to continue to evolve. And there's always room for improvement. And also to embody, you know, kind of the spirit of continuing to improve, Quality Matters continues to update their rubric. So right now, we are on the sixth edition of the Quality Matters course design rubric. And we are getting ready for the seventh edition to come out. Um, and I'll talk to you about this in just a moment. But it's scheduled to come out on July 5th of this year. So we're already seeing some new developments. Another principle that goes with Quality Matters is this idea that it's centered around research and student learning. So as I discovered, Quality Matters actually um, developed as part of a federal um, grant program. And so again, I do want to emphasize that Quality Matters is nonprofit. Um, but this part of the federal grant program was where they brought together a bunch of researchers from various fields of study. And together, they collectively uh, established all these ideas or criterions of what constitutes online course quality. So again, it's very much centered around this research. Quality Matters is also collegial, which again, kind of goes back to this idea of uh, shared responsibility or shared governance. So it is faculty driven and it's very supportive. One of the things that we're going to discuss a little bit here is that Quality Matters is not this pass or fail system. They're going to look at your course and they're going to provide feedback which of course leads directly into being collaborative and this is again where the review is conducted with peers so if you ever want your course reviewed by quality matters a team of three people are going to look at your course so um, typically this involves i think one of them has to be a subject matter expert so if you are teaching in the field of medicine you can expect somebody with a medical background to be on the team um, and a minimum of one of these people is going to be external to your own institution. So at least one person would not be from NIU, maybe more. So I know we said we were going to discuss what does it mean to establish course quality? And I think course quality is a lot of moving parts. It's not something that's easily summarized in just a single sentence. 
So I came up with, I think, seven different components here to, to take a look at. Um, the very first tile that you see here is course design, and this is probably the one that is most heavily uh, looked at. The course design is the actual structure of your course. It's going to be the content. It, it's going to be um, everything that your students navigate in your class in an online setting. They're also going to look at the course delivery, which I like to think of as the actual instruction or the teaching. This can be a little bit harder to um, assess. So I would say that there is probably a heavier focus on the course design, but course delivery is still part of it. Then there's going to be an emphasis on the quality of your course content. So this could be many different things. If you have videos, they might be looking at the sound quality, or if you have edited subtitles, they also might be looking at your assessments, whether that's assignments or exams or discussion boards. They might look at the quality of the, the questions that you're, you're supplying for your students. Typically, there's a course management system involved when you teach online. So for NIU, it's going to be Blackboard. Um, I suppose you could teach without an LMS system, but um, that's becoming more rare. You're also going to want to look at the university infrastructure as a whole. How ready are they to take on online courses and to support their online learners? And of course, you've got the, the last two big components here. Faculty readiness, are your faculty experienced in teaching online or have they worked with an instructional designer? Have they taken any professional development um, types of activities to, to gear up towards teaching online? So all of that factors in there. As well as your students, you know, have they taken any online courses? Are they prepared to, to take on this type of learning? It is different than the face-to-face -face classroom instruction. So uh, if they're brand new to it, then we have to be able to support them and help them make that adjustment. Questions so far, or should I move on? Okay, it sounds quiet. All right, so part of looking um, at QM is also looking at what they are not. So um, just to clarify a couple of things that they are not, um, it is not about the individual instructor whatsoever. Um, this is not any type of faculty or instructor evaluation. Um, it is strictly really about the, the course design. Um, QM is not a faculty evaluation. Um, again, it is going to go back to the course quality. So design and quality, I think, kind of go hand in hand. Um, but again, I, I do want to stress that it's not about the individual who's teaching the course. Uh, QM is not a pass or fail diagnostic. If you went for the Quality Matters course review process, which by the way is voluntary, um, even if you did not meet standards on the first try, they would give you feedback on ways in which you could meet that criteria. They might encourage you to work with an instructional designer, um, but then they would ask you to resubmit, and I think they give you something like 14 months in which to work on uh, the various components that they've suggested for revisions. So really, it is all about improvement. And QM is not about perfection. So Quality Matters came up with a rubric, which I know I keep talking about, and we will get to that. Um, but this rubric that they came up with is, again, not about perfection. It's all about being above average. And so they attribute points to each of their criterions, and they just said that your course should be about 85% or higher. So again, it's this idea that you've really accomplished something um, that's really kind of outstanding with your online course design and course quality, but there's still this idea that we can always improve no matter what. We never plateau as instructors. We, we can keep evolving. So now we can take a look at the QM course review process. And I apologize, you know, my, my little circle um, diagram there got a little small, but I can walk you through this process. So the QM course review process, if you ever decided to do this, um, starts with a course representative. It's typically the instructor 
but they volunteer and sign up to have their course reviewed. The course review process, I think, can take up to six weeks, four to six weeks. Um, and that's when the team of three people will go through there and review your course in its entirety. They will give you feedback, uh, whether you, you pass on the first try or if they suggest a revision, everybody gets uh, feedback. And then if you do not pass on the first try, then you can revise and resubmit, um, at which point then your course is QM certified. So here's some interesting information. Um, and for those of you who have heard about QM before, so some of these things may have changed a little bit or are about to change, I should say. Your course itself, um, once it is certified, is certified for five years. And so you can search this on the QM website. You can see all of the courses um, in the US that have been certified. So that's kind of exciting. Um, once your course has been certified for five years, you can ask for recertification, which would give you another three years of, of certification. So that would be a total of eight years, or you could just go for a re-review. So it's kind of your choice out. The QM process, they, they really want to look at mature courses. That's something else that I forgot to mention earlier. They're looking at courses that have been taught several times. And that's because they know that when you're first developing a course, there's a lot of kinks that have to be worked out. And so to achieve the best possible course quality, they, they want an instructor who's taught this you know, three or four times. Over 1,300 institutions subscribe to Quality Matters, and NIU joined in 2014. So we've been with them for, for some time now. And I think I did mention to you that the Quality Matters rubric is currently on the sixth edition, and it's about to change. So we are getting ready for the um, seventh edition. And they've given us a little bit of a sneak preview on things to come. So I thought I would share that with you. Um, they said it will come out, I believe, July 5th, and there's going to be some additional criteria that speaks to um, diversity, equity, and inclusion elements. They're also going to have some elements that speak to non-credit courses. Uh, this is something that we're seeing more and more um, as we, we get students who are transferring in from other institutions or maybe they've switched uh, majors. Sometimes we can offer them courses that they need as prerequisites, but for zero credit. So they're going to have additional criteria for that. And they said specifically related to the pandemic, um, there are issues that they want to focus on um, specifically related to inclusive design considerations. And they also want more standards related to course accessibility. So I don't know exactly what the these standards are going to be, um, but those are some of the issues that they're going to address. And I've also heard um, that they're going to change who can be a course reviewer. So in the past, it's always been um, peers who are teaching online, but some of the other experts in the field are instructional designers whose you know, daily focus is on creating streamlined, um, strongly structured online courses. And I believe they will also have the ability to review courses. So that's kind of an exciting update. All right. So what does it look like at NIU? Well, it is our guiding standard for quality course design. Um, we, again, want to stipulate that it is entirely voluntary. It may at some point um, be something that's required by departments or highly encouraged, but um, for the most part, it is really entirely voluntary. Our instructional designers use QM as a baseline measure to promote their courses and programs. And of course, you can grow um, along with us and join this group of faculty committed to quality online instruction. All right. So now we're going to get to some of the uh, interactive parts. So I promised that we were going to take a look at Quality Matters and see what it looks like and how does this apply to your course. Um, so Quality Matters came up with a rubric specifically for higher education. They do have different rubrics out there. Uh, this one is for higher education. 
and it has what I call uh, 42 specific criteriums that we look at. Um, however, to, to make this more manageable, they've divided it up into eight different categories. And so that, that is our activity um, that we're leading up to. So these eight different categories come up with the course overview and introduction. Um, so this is the part where you're going to introduce students to your course and give them specific guidance on how to navigate your online class. The learning objectives, these really kind of form the foundation uh, for all of the, the criteria for QM. You know, by the end of this course, what should your students be able to do? Um, this is really kind of the bottom line to make sure that everything is aligned in your course. The assessment and measurement piece, I always think of this as um, the graded activities in your, in your course, but this is how your students are being evaluated. The instructional materials, I think is pretty self-explanatory, but that could just be any of your content. So whether that's video, multimedia, if it's any type of reading material, et cetera. Uh, course activities and learner interaction, I've learned with QM, they differentiate this from assessment and measurement. Um, assessment and measurement is really how your students are being evaluated, but activities could just be any type of situation where you're asking your students to participate in something, um, to expand their skills or their, their knowledge. So it's kind of the warm up or the practice and the learner interaction. So this could be interaction between you and the students, um, the students and, and the rest of their peers, or even the um, students interacting with the course content. First, you want to make sure you have the right technology, that you've selected the components that are correct for your unique class. We want to support our learners. There are some basic principles on things that we think should be included in all courses, regardless of uh, field or discipline. And then the accessibility and usability. And this, again, goes back to the, the navigation of your course. And can any learner um, navigate your, your course easily? So I did just want to throw this in here again. Um, I think I mentioned earlier that the learning objectives really are the, the foundation of QM. Um, so this is kind of how they look at the connection between the course elements. Right there, down at the bottom, we have the learning objectives. Um, QM is really good about looking at learning objectives. They will ask you if you ever sign up for a course review, if your learning objectives are department mandated, or if there's something that you are allowed to adjust as an instructor. So if the learning objectives are not something you can change, um, then they will defer you know, to your department. Um, if they are something that you're allowed to change at an individual level, um, they may even provide some suggestions or feedback if they think they could be improved. So um, here we've got the, the kind of the three different pillars that stem off of the learning objectives, which includes your instructional material, the learner interaction and engagement, and of course your course technology. Um, so if you have all three of those pieces, um, then it kind of upholds the assessment and measurement. Um, assuming you've introduced all of those correct ingredients, then when the students get to that assessment, um, you know, they're, they're going to feel appropriately prepared. I know we're going pretty fast here, but I want to make sure we're right at the halfway mark. So I want to give you enough time for, for some of the activities and to let you um, take a look at your own courses. This is actually uh, a photo of one of the QM rubrics if you ever want to look at one of their booklets. So um, QM has, I think we said, different types of standards and they give you different point values for them um, based on what their level of importance. So I'll take you through that in just a moment here. But they also give you annotations, which is really nice. Um, they, they give you step-by-step -step, um, descriptions for how, if you're a reviewer, you should um, be evaluating these courses. Right? Certainly, unique individuals will be reviewing your courses, but they give very strict, strict guidelines for what they should be looking for. So here it is again, this is the, the QM uh, 
scoring. I think I told you there were 42 different um, criterions or, or standards, if you will. Um, so there are 23 of them are what they consider essential. So those are the things that every online course should have. Um, they give those three points a piece. They have 12 of them that they think are very important and then um, seven of them that it's still important but not quite as crucial. And they want you to achieve 85% on each of the standards. So what this means is that you would have to hit all of the essential standards. Um, you're, you can't miss any of those. Uh, but once you hit all of the essential standards, you can just do a combination of the one and two point um, criterions to hit that 85% benchmark. So again, that goes back to you must have 85% on your overall course review. Um, but still, it's this idea that it, it's a really good course. It doesn't have to be perfect. Okay. So I think I'm done talking, so I'm going to turn it over to you. And I wanted to show you what some of these specific criteriums look like. So remember, we had the eight different sections. I have um, something from each of the sections that I pulled off of the rubric. So you can see some of these elements that they think um, every online course should have. And I'm going to ask you where, where you would find these in your course, what they would look like. And I'll give you a hint. They're often found in more than one place. So you can type on the chat or you can come on the microphone, whatever you prefer. But one of them is in the course overview and introduction. So as soon as students come into your course, they should have uh, some sort of an introduction. And in there, they should have instructions that make clear how to get started and where to find various course components. How would you set this up in your online course? What would it look like? I'm going to talk because it's easier than typing. <laughs> sure. um, I have in my Blackboard course, I have a course overview where I've got the, the instructions for success in the course. And then for each week, I have an overview of um, instructions for how to approach the week, what materials they need, what readings there are, the due dates, things like that. Perfect. And and so when you said you have instructions for each week, does that mean you're using um, is it like modules or folders? Um, in I'm using I'm teaching with Blackboard Ultra, and I have each week is a folder, um, and Perfect. within that I've got you know introduction and overview, um, graded elements, um, assigned readings, and then assessments, and so each of those is a subfolder. Perfect. Excellent. I love it. Does anyone else do something different? This is Ellen. Yeah, I usually do the same thing. I use modules as well. And um, there's, I'm using Ultra as well, which is really nice because you all have that kind of um, defined for us now if we want to utilize that. So things are way easier to um, find, I think, for as a student. But under syllabus, I usually include my objectives and a schedule. And then in my content, I have the individual modules, which are each week. And then in each week, I break it down into their reading material, their um, any homework that they may have, any labs that they're doing. And so very similar to um, the last gal. Sorry, my dog is starting to bark and I'm going to like <laughs> Well, thank you for joining us. <laughs> yeah, She's, she likes to be vocal. I love it. Excellent. I love all of these ideas. Um, I think what Ellen was just saying there is we do have um, a generic course template. I don't know if everyone's aware of this or not, um, but Seidel came up with this. If you ever would like us to insert a template into your course, they're 100% customizable. You can add or delete things as needed. Um, but it just kind of outlines some of these uh, specific areas that you, you might want to include some of this content. Um, so I think actually even one of the things that they have in the, um, the template is they might even have a, a little section that says, get started here or getting started. Um, so that's another way to do it. But um, both of you touched on some excellent points. You can have folders or modules that explain where to get started. You can reiterate it in your syllabus. 
Sometimes students navigate your course in different ways. They, they might go in chronological order or they might just go straight to a specific section. And so it's really nice to have these different elements appear in more than one area. I think that kind of covers um, learners are introduced to the purpose and structure of the course. Um, anything else that you would add to that? Okay, one thing that you may consider um, including in here would be, um, again, another description of the, the course so that students are reminded, you know, what is the purpose of the, the course and what are its goals. And again, you can put this in multiple areas. You could put this in your syllabus, you could get it in the getting started section. So lots of different opportunities here. All right, I've got one from each of these eight sections. So um, we'll take a look at these. The next area that they really focus on is, again, going back to the learning objectives and competencies. And so I often write these from the student perspective, if I can. You know, by the end of this course, students should be able to... How do you, how do you go about um, making sure students see the learning objectives? How do you do this? And I have the learning objectives in my course overview and introduction. And then I have um, the objectives for each week. By the end of this week, students will be able to. Yes, excellent. I love that. Um, so there are different levels of course learning objectives. Sometimes the course learning objectives are mandated by your department. And so if those are something that are permanent fixtures, you, you don't have to worry about that. You may not be able to um, adjust those, but by a weekly or unit level, you can provide guidance for your students on what they should hope to achieve kind of in smaller pieces. And those uh, should help them you know, ultimately prepare for the large course learning objectives. All right, I see that Ellen puts them in each lab for the week. Elise said hers are listed in each module as well as on the syllabus. Yes, excellent. I love that they're listed in multiple places. That's wonderful. Okay, so number three, we've got the assessments measure the achievement of the stated learning objectives or competencies. And again, I, I think of assessments from the QM um, perspective as kind of like the graded or the evaluated work that your students submit. How would this be determined? I'm not entirely sure what you are asking for. Assessments measure the achievement in the student learning. How would this be determined? Um, I offer a rubric for the major, for the graded assessment. Are you, you're here talking about graded elements, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I offer um, like a, some of, one of the big elements because it's a history class is participation and discussion, which is difficult to grade. And so I offer a rubric in the um, in the syllabus that says, you know, an A looks like this, a B looks like this, and it includes specific criteria that the students must meet to get at least um, that grade. Um, and that is, it's in the syllabus, it's in the Blackboard. Um, I'm not sure students look at it, <laughs> but we do have, um, I have a review every Friday, a student does the self-assessment where they, they have to grade their own participation as um, beginning, um, uh, in developing and um, improving or something like that. Great. Okay, so you're speaking to both of these that are up here too. I, I love that you um, jumped right into the second one as well. 
Um, so that also includes you know, providing that descriptive criteria. Sometimes we don't know whether our students are reading things or not, um, but still, you can't say that you didn't provide it. Um, and it's this idea that students know how they're going to be evaluated, how they're going to be graded. Uh, so, so I think you definitely touched on a bunch of different components there. Um, and I'm looking at the chat as well. Um, Ellen says students submit a lab report each week and also homework from the week. Yes, so I, I think a lot of what gets down to with assessment um, and measurement is if you had somebody from QM, and when I say somebody, you know, this again would be that trio of, of people who would be looking at your course, I think they'd be looking for alignment. Um, you know, they want to make sure that the the things that students are being evaluated on are, are going to help them achieve their their ultimate course goals. So for instance, if one of the large course learning objectives is to synthesize complex um, ideas and you know to evaluate something, right? They're they're going to be looking for what types of um, activities or assessments support that. Right, they're going to be looking at, oh, if you're going to synthesize something, you can't just have all multiple choice exams, right? Synthes synthesizing something um, is going to require some other effort from your students. So they're going to be looking at making sure that all of your graded assessments are going to help them achieve that overall course learning objective. Kind of the same thing with instructional materials here. Um, the instructional materials contribute to the achievement of the stated learning objectives. Um, how do you know that? If you looked at a stranger's course, how would you know if their instructional materials contribute to the achievement of the stated learning objectives? Um, one way I, I can think of that is um, to make sure that the instructional materials give the students what they need to succeed on the um, on the assignments. Like if we're asking them to do something, if we say we have an objective, but we don't give them the inputs to be able to do that, that's bad. <laughs> so I guess evaluating whether the how the materials are used in student assessment, um, I think that might be a way. And I see, I agree. Uh, I see some activity here in the chat. Often textbooks have objectives for each chapter and those can be coordinated, absolutely. Um, particularly if the textbooks have any type of, um, you know, title that corresponds with, you know, maybe you've given titles to each of your units or weekly modules. Um, you know, if those correspond, that can often help. Um, I think another idea with instructional materials is um, you may want to look at sometimes the relevancy. For instance, um, if you're in a science field, you'll probably be looking at material that was published fairly recently. Makes sense. Okay. Ooh, I like this. Ellen often will provide videos uh, for her lab how-to videos, demonstration, that's great. That's real-time uh, material there, absolutely. Some of these get harder as they go along. Like, we would just wish that some of these things by QM, they were just easy things. You could say, yes, they have a statement in their syllabus, um, but, but some of them are, are subjective, so it, it does get tricky. Um, Take this one. The course models the academic integrity expected of learners by providing both source references and permissions for use of instructional materials. So where is this observed or have you ever seen uh, examples maybe where this this kind of rule or guideline was not um, observed or followed? I have a statement, um, an academic integrity statement in my syllabus. Um, and my syllabus is also 
like I both have a downloadable document and I've got a section on my Blackboard that just reproduces it. Um, in some classes, I require students to take the academic integrity certificate that's offered through um, the university. Uh, it's hard to pass. I've taken it myself and it's it, well, I, it's been a while since I took it. Um, but, you know, aside from that, I don't, and safe assign, I guess um, I use safe assign for when students submit materials. But um, yeah, I think the only thing I know how to do is put an integrity statement with a definition of what um, plagiarism is, for example, and what permissions are necessary. Yep, safe assign, integrity statements, um, things that you can also include in your syllabus. Yes, these are all examples. Um, as since we're supposed to model this behavior, we can always try to make sure. Oops, sorry, I think that was my microphone. Uh, I don't know if we got any feedback on that. Uh, but as instructors, we can always try to make sure that um, we acknowledge where we collected our resources from. If we're using a video, try to include you know, the author or the source, ask permission if we can use it. Um, one of the things we have to be careful about um, is this idea, like sometimes I've seen where somebody made um, a photocopy of, of part of a text and then they uploaded it. Um, you know, we, we have to think about that. Um, is that really um, an ethical decision? Is that a copyright infringement? Uh, maybe a better Maybe a better option would be to talk to our librarian and see if we can get some e-texts or open educational resources that we can pull in. Great. Yep, state the permission of use if someone is borrowing material. Absolutely. Wonderful. Right, we're, we're making good progress here. Course activities and learner interaction. So the learning activities promote the achievement of the stated learning objectives or competencies. So again, I think this kind of goes back to, I, I think of activities as the warm up um, and maybe not the assessment, right? So another way of thinking about this is if we were going to evaluate somebody's um, workout, they were, they were gonna be lifting weights, right? We would, we would look at their actual workout, um, but we wouldn't be evaluating their warm-up routine. Um, so, so try to think of kind of like the course activities as some of the, those warm-up things, but um, they, still, they still need to all kind of correspond, right? We, we're looking for that alignment. So here we go. If your objective was to synthesize complex concepts and apply critical thinking skills, what's an activity that would be appropriate for that type of objective? I know I'm putting you on the spot. Well, for me, it's obvious. That's writing or speaking. Like students would write um, an analytical essay. Um, I use um, I use course discussion, a discussion board. My the class that I'm referring to specifically, the the motivation for taking this um, class with you, Megan, is. Um, it's a Latin American studies course that has students from all across the university. It's interdisciplinary and I'm not sure what their skills are. And so um, what I do is I try to build up their skills. And one of them is to, um, we have um, an activity every week we have discussion. They all post a discussion prompt answer. I choose three and I ask them to engage with one with which they either agree, disagree, or agree, but want to extend. And they um, they state their position and they state why. Um, and so they have to, and they have to use evidence from the readings to um, support it. And this isn't graded. It's um, it's considered attendance and participation. So I guess it is sort of graded. But the fact that they post is um, what I count. Um, but I use their posts and my feedback to their posts to guide them to think critically. Great, I love this. And would you say that this is an asynchronous activity? Uh, it is, it's completely asynchronous. I The thing that I don't know is, um, I tried to do a, a blended class where we had like asynchronous Mondays and synchronous Wednesdays. 
and the university's scheduling software didn't know how to do that and they listed mm -hmm. it as two separate classes it was confusing and students wouldn't do it so i was asked to be completely asynchronous um but what i wanted to do when i designed the course was to use a synchronous moment to extend like to have go through some of those answers but there to also introduce like um, student learning skills, like how do you use the library? How do you write a topic sentence? Things that weren't content related or necessarily course related. So I was marrying the analytical stuff with just basic core competencies for students. Um, and I did that once during COVID because I could do whatever I want because it was all new. Um, and now that we're back to normal, I wasn't able to have an interactive component. So it's all asynchronous. I'm trying to make it as interactive as possible, but it is asynchronous. Gotcha. Excellent. I, I love this. I think um, other instructors have faced your problem as well. Um, what I've seen in the past is some instructors would list their courses fully synchronous, and then they would tell their students on the first day that um, there's only a few days that are synchronous, and then it felt like a big gift to the students. But uh, that is actually on a side note. So I really love this idea, though, that you're asking them to write, or you also mentioned um, you could even ask them potentially, I know maybe not in an asynchronous course, um, unless they did a recording, but it could also be an oral component where they have to talk through their their logic or their thought process that, that all speaks to synthesizing something. I was going to mention this when we get to technology, but I do because it's asynchronous and I want to I want them to get to know each other. I do use Flipgrid where they have sometimes they do these discussions um, through video. Wonderful. I love this of all of this. I am, I'm keeping an eye on the chat, too. So you use a discussion board to achieve these things. I love those um, students must use critical thinking skills after they perform their lab um, each week. Um, since in the lab they obtain data and then they have to interpret it. Perfect. So now they have, you know, all of this rich information, but now they have to do something with it. Yes, exactly. Perfect. And like you said, you're, you're going to adjust. We, we naturally do this as instructors, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous. Um, you know, if you have a synchronous session in there, you could always do um, some type of small discussion activity, work on synthesizing things as a group. Um, and another activity could be breakouts where you give them a problem solving exercise. Right? Ask them as a group to, to solve a problem. Excellent. Okay. Well, you, you did just tap on this. Um, we were saying, what about course technology? Um, so how do you know if the right tool has been so selected? Um, what are the signs? For that matter, have you ever observed something where you thought something didn't align? I only know the things that I learned through um, SIDL. <laughs> so I use um, Flipgrid and I use um, Padlet. And so those are, I feel like they're both pretty easy tools to evaluate whether they're being successful. And I think they both are really successful. I don't know other tools. Great. I like that I'm hearing in the chat too. Student feedback is helpful with this. Uh, students will be the first ones to tell you if they found something frustrating, if they couldn't navigate it, if they didn't understand it or its purpose. Um, yes, absolutely. So um, eliciting student feedback, you know, that, that can be um, very helpful with this. Sometimes there's a lot of technology out there, and I think the temptation is to jump in and use all of it. Um, and, and that can be overwhelming for you as the instructor if you have to troubleshoot it, and it can be very overwhelming for the students as well. Um, so that that's, you know, oftentimes um, a pause. Yes, if you get students emailing you with many questions, absolutely. Okay. Two more. We're going to make it um, learner support. So this is where you've got some sort of instruction somewhere in your course um, that link to clear description of technical support offered and how to obtain it. 
Um, and I also like this bottom one a lot. I'm curious what you think um, about this one particularly. Course instructions articulate or link to um, the institution's academic support services and resources that can help learners succeed in the course. Um, what are those resources? Specifically for NIU, if you want to take it that far. Um, what are the types of things that we should be giving our students? DRC? Yeah, I have a section in the right after the start here or intro to the class, like something called um, support for students. And I have a link to tech support to DRC to the library. Um, and not just dead links, I describe how they can, I mean, and not just the links, I describe what they can go to each of these um, for. Great, great, excellent. Yep, I see definitely uh, the DRC up there. So some other things that you may want to consider as well, the writing center. Yeah, so there's all these different um, tools. And one of the things that NIU came out with now is um, whenever somebody logs into Blackboard, if you look on the left-hand navigation of your screen, instead of um, going to courses, go towards the bottom and you'll see something called Blackboard Assist. And it even has a little bubble next to it and it says new. Um, this actually houses all of the different support resources for NIU students, and it's updated and maintained regularly so that all of their contact information um, is current and accurate. So it's really nice. It's kind of like a one-stop shop. If you have a chance, I encourage you to check it out. Um, it is, uh, like I said, as soon as you log into Blackboard on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, so there's that. We also have things like NIU Student Life Site, which is filled with uh, all different types of tips for students. And um, we have another website that's for student success tips and tools. Um, so those are some other things that we can include, just very specific to NIU students. Um, but I, I do like that we've condensed it because I often felt like as an instructor, every time I, I would have to go and update my syllabus or my student support page or both, uh, I was checking a lot of links so it's really nice that students can go to one place and see all of those resources great oh good i'm glad you found it Whew, i know we're getting um a little bit close to the end here uh, we do have accessibility and usability so um, it sounds like more is to come with the seventh edition of the qm rubric um, but I guess, how do you determine it? Oh, good. I always check with um, the student view. I, I think that it's clear to me, um, but I always check. I use the student preview to see what they see. And I often find that I haven't given them permission to <laughs> enter a part of the class or something like that. Yes, I love that. Oh, wonderful. Great tip. the least number of clicks to get to something. Yes. Um, if you're using Blackboard Ultra, one of the nice things is they, they've they kind of restricted how many folders within folders you can have. Um, some Sometimes it's easy to have like this kind of crazy tunnel of folder within a folder within a folder. Um, so they've, they've kind of flattened that out a bit. Great. I often think of accessibility and usability also things like, oh, I recorded my lecture, but um, you know, Maybe somebody has a hearing impairment. Um, it's a really great idea if I use uh, Keltora Capture to upload my recording because I know it auto captions it, something like that. Okay, I know we're just about out of time here. Um, so I wanted to give you just a couple of other quick tips that we have for you um, at NIU. So QM is probably one of the most intense um, course review processes out there. I, I love their standards. Um, personally, I don't think I would jump straight into asking for a QM course review. I would like to work my way up towards it. Um, so one of the things that we've done is we built an NIU Quality Essentials internal course review. And we also have um, a workshop just devoted to NIU Quality Essentials. Uh, but basically, we took these 42 different standards or criteriums, um, call them what you like, from uh, Quality Matters and we scaled them down. And we said out of those uh, 42, we 
we listed what NIU considers to be the 23 essential standards. Um, and we can evaluate your course to see if you meet those 23 standards. Um, and then you get a bunch of recognition for that as well. So that's a nice way to start gearing up towards Quality Matters. Uh, then the next one up, there's also a Blackboard Exemplary Course Program Review. So um, you could ask somebody um, outside of NIU to review your course. Um, and this is based on Blackboard standards. And then um, if you go up past that, then I think you'd probably be getting ready for its quality matters. But um, it's this idea that we want to give you a nice tiered approach and support you. We don't want to just toss you into the deep end of the pool. So um, these are the steps for the Quality Essentials course review process. And again, we have a whole workshop for it, but you log in, you, you do a self-evaluation, you request somebody from CIDL to review your course. So it could be me, it could be one of my colleagues. Um, we'll get back to you with the, um, we'll review your course and your um, self-review and we'll provide you some feedback. And then um, either if you meet the quality essentials recognition on the first time around, you'll get awarded with a um, digital badge or you can resubmit. And I will send you all of this with some follow-up information. I see that we are at three o'clock on the dot. I'm so sorry. I know I took a full hour. Um, I'm gonna leave this up on the screen. These are some of the benefits of the course review, but if I can answer any questions um, or if there's anything you wanna talk about, let me know. Otherwise I'll stay around for a few minutes. Um, but if not, thank you for joining me and I hope you have a wonderful afternoon.